Welcome back into the film room. I am your host, Eric Turner. I'm joined this week, of course, by Nate Geary from WGR. What's going on, Nate? Nothing much, man. Enjoying another Victory uh, Tuesday, uh, getting ready for uh, what I would call Victory Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, where, you know, <laughs> the rest of your week, you just feel great because the Bills won and they're eight and something now. Eight and three, yes. Eight and three. And I mean, you know, after what, as Bill fan, Bills fans, we've been through the last couple of years, I'll tell you what, man, I enjoy every victory. I don't care. If it's uh, just a 10-point victory with no style points, three turnovers in the fourth quarter, I don't care. Guess what? At the end of the day, they got the W. But that doesn't mean we can't jump into some film, look at some stats, and see where they struggled right. and what they actually excelled at. And I want to get your thoughts from the top down, from Brian Dable and the staff, and what they brought to the table. First of all, from a run game perspective, because it was a game that they leaned on the run, especially late in the game, to kind of close it out and get, you know, get that victory, that eighth victory of the year. Yeah, what I would call, Eric, um, a promising development in the way that they feel they can attack defenses. Um, and, you know, what I sort of mean by that is when you're Brian Dable, Brian Dable comes from the school of thought and comes from the New England Patriots system where from game to game, from week to week, you changed the way you changed your entire approach, yes. your, the balance of your offense to, to cater to, well, not cater to is the wrong word, to to play to your strengths and the weaknesses of the defense. Sure. And this game, the game against New England, I think you have two prime examples of this team changing their identity and also having, I would say, moderate to pretty good success doing it um, over the course of the game. I thought from start to finish, this was the best running uh, efficiency I've seen from this team right. um, all season long. I thought up until the fumble that it was Devin Singletary's best game of the season. And I, I think from an overall uh, volume perspective, you know, I think Zach Moss has brought some, maybe a couple of better plays from other games, but from start to finish, I thought it was his most consistent game. Um, and then you add in the element of Josh as the runner as well. And then you're starting to see the run game that I think a lot of people thought they might see a little more regularly having said that i'm good with how they're going to end up finding their balance at the end of the year yeah we talked about this multiple times over a courses of years together doing this with you and we know that from week to week from month to month from year to year you're going to change your approach and how you do things and um in this game the looks that the defense were going to give the bills which we knew they were going to run a lot of nickel and a lot of dime looks with that third safety on the field yeah. because of that those are prime run looks and in, in games like that, you need to be able to rely on your offensive line because they're going to need to do it against looks in January and in late December where this team's going to have to run the football. Um, so it was good to see that when they, you know, focused a game plan on that, that they were very easily able to maneuver and, and, and pivot um, sort of what they do as a team and how they're going to win. So I, I think from that perspective and their evolution as an offense and ultimately by the end of the year, you know, this team is going to have, I think, a fairly close 55 to 60 to 40 um, pass to run. And I think they're going to do that by having games where they pass a lot and run almost none and games where they run a lot and they don't pass as much. And that is how they're creating balance in their offense. It's a week to week balance, not a series to series or play to play balance. And for me, that is what I think I've been clamoring for because it, it, it requires your offense and your offensive coordinator to play and coach with a level of feel, like understanding in the rhythm of a game, if your game plan of going either run or pass heavy will work and you're gonna get that feel typically early in a football game. And I think in this game, the Bills very early on knew they were getting the very best from Joey Bosa. And Joey Bosa is the type of player that week in and week out does not bring the same level of performance because if he brought that every week, he'd be the best defensive end in football. And he is definitely talked about and regarded as one of those players, but he's certainly not considered the best. And that's why it's that level of play. And he brought it on Sunday and against Daryl Williams and against Deion Dawkins when he was faced up with him. I thought that he dictated very early on the game plan from an aggressiveness approach and from how they wanted to ultimately move away from, or in some cases run directly at Joey Bosa. So I think, right. you know, early on in this game, Eric, a lot of what they did was dictated by the play of Joey Bosa. And I think it showed in how conservative they played <laughs> and something I know you're going to go over um, how vanilla they looked. Yeah, I thought from a game plan perspective, I thought it was very vanilla from Brian Dable. Now, don't get me wrong. Let's talk about the Joey Bosa thing and how 
they did try to attack them. They, they ran several zone reads. They ran zone reads with a triple option throw out to the boundary. They did some creative things. Obviously, the touchdown with Cole Beasley, it's not that he wasn't creative and wasn't aggressive in certain areas. And, you know, he wasn't passive when trying to attack Bosa in the run game. They ran the ball 30 times for 172 yards, one touchdown. Uh, they ran it very effectively. Now, is it a little higher than in, as far as frequency goes? Yes, it is for what they've been doing all year. But I agree. I think part of that is to wear down Bosa a little bit. Now, did it work? No. I mean, obviously it didn't. And you talked about how Bosa was effective early on. I mean, two of his sacks were in that first half and several pressures. Uh, and we're going to be going over some of those. But I do think that his passing game plan, Dable's passing game plan, was pretty vanilla. And I think that really kind of minimized Josh from a perspective of, okay, well, you know, if we're not going to be super aggressive in the passing game, we're not going to be able to hit passes down the field against that cover three and those quarter looks. Well, I am going to, you know, do those short passes, the digs. Cole Beasley was, I, I want to say, based on his season, he was pretty much eliminated by Chris Harris in this game. And that really hurt the offense, I think, because as we've gone over, Nate, and, you know, kind of what Brown you alluded effect, to. Derek. Yeah, and John, the yes, John of course. But we also relied on Cole Beasley on those screens, on those RPOs, on those short passes when those guys were blitzing off the edge as part of the run game. So with, you know, Beasley taken out in that area by Chris Harris, a very good slot corner, the Bills obviously had to lean on a, a good run game. And thank God it was there because those short passes as an extension of the run game weren't there. And as you guys can see, you know, Bosa and that defense, you know, they brought it. They only blitzed six times uh, at Josh Allen and he had 31 yards on those plays, but he was only under pressure 10 times and they still registered several sacks. So what happened? And, and that's what we're going to kind of go over because it, I thought that Dable ran three, four concepts out of two by two sets, whether it was under uh, under uh, center or from shotgun. And I thought those concepts were shut down pretty easily by the Chargers uh, defense. We're, like, again, we're going to go over some of these plays. And I thought that, uh, you know, Dable didn't really have many wrinkles on top of it. And he didn't really use a lot of motion, no eye candy, no change in presentations to kind of window dress these plays. And I think part of the reason was, and it's something that we talked about before we went live here, Nate, I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, the dime looks that the Chargers play and, you know, those guys like Rayshon Jenkins is a good safety that can, you know, run, play in the box, can rush the passer. Um, but they wanted to make sure they knew where Bosa was. They didn't want to have all these motions and, and different looks to to uh, really confuse the protections and, and really confuse Josh. And obviously Mitch Morris, his first game back, I think that really limited what Dable did or could do from a perspective of, you know, the presentations and whatnot. So while it was a vanilla game plan, I think there was, it was so vanilla. It was almost obvious that it was sort of calculated that, you know, we want to find where Bosa is. We don't want to have too many changes in, in the alignments and formations because then the, the protection changes, especially if they're sending more than four guys, which obviously they didn't do all that often. So Bosa just had a game, and some of those interior defenders did as well against specifically Brian Winters and John Feliciano. I thought those two guards both struggled in this game. So what are your thoughts on, you know, Brian Dable's uh, uh, concepts and how Josh Allen handled this? Because if you look at just the numbers, it looks like he had a pretty efficient day, but you'll see why he was just taking those short passes, as you kind of alluded to, to digs and whatnot. Yeah, you know, and not only that, I, I think we ended up seeing a lot of passing concepts that had the wide receivers back facing the line of scrimmage and coming towards the quarterback. And I think it hurt him in, in yards after catch in this game, um, because if you're going to really exist and try to live and thrive in the short passing game, which you mentioned, that, which I, I love the, the way that you mentioned it as sort of the extension of the run game, which sure. is what they tried to make it. And I think um, in this game, I, I think, you know, I, I wonder what you think of this as well, Eric. And after the bye week, having two weeks to prepare, it's certainly, to your point, almost seems calculated mm -hmm. because how could you come with having two weeks to prepare for this, yes. this, this Thank you. Chargers team? Yep. Um, it just seems that from what we've watched week in and week out, there is, it feels like something's amiss there. Um, so it, to me, it all, I have to give this, this coaching staff, particularly Brian Dable, the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. That what we've seen all year 
you getting two weeks to, pre to prepare an offense that's getting healthier. Um, I know no John Brown, but no Brown, I, yeah. I, your point about Cole Beasley though is not lost on me. Right. Um, you know, when you, the, one of the beauties of Cole Beasley in this offense as designed is he's double team proof because you can't double team Cole Beasley in the middle when you've got Diggs and Brown to the outside. There's yeah. just simply too much to worry about from a defensive standpoint. When you get the opportunity to bracket and, <clears throat> and, and, and pattern match and have guys that are sort of occupying the zones that he can manipulate a defender away from just to create that extra bit of separation. Um, I mean, Chris Harris, that's his first game back. Yeah, I mean, he looked every bit of the guy that the good. Bills were, were were hoping to get in the offseason. I mean, he right. really is one of the premier slot corners in football, and he proved that. And 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 I think that's the other point I want to make is Joey Bosa had a fantastic game. He had an eye-popping game from film uh, and from the, the box score. But the other thing that I think really affected this team, and luckily they won't really see another secondary like this until you get to New England, who has a little bit more of an aged secondary but offers – a similar type of versatility um like this is a very versatile a very interesting like manned defense from the right. secondary's perspective and there's a lot of cover three looks in this game and single high safety looks that start there as a single high but don't exactly play like it and i think when you're josh allen and you're starting to see some things now halfway through the season that you definitely were not seeing in the first half of the year when defenses were forced to play more vanilla because of COVID and their lack of training camp. Think about that too, Eric, is defenses now are starting to get into a groove across the league. The historic right. numbers, we, the scoring numbers we've seen across the league have all started to sort of come back down to earth a little bit. And the reason is defenses are finally catching, the, catching up and they're catching their breath. So uh, these, I know it's a lot that, to, to kind of throw at, at, at what we think is the potential issue from this game, but I think it's less of an issue and more of an approach um, perspective. And, and I know you share that, that, that same thought process as well. Yeah, and the other topic I want to discuss, because it's something we love to talk about and we haven't talked about in a few weeks, is play action. Uh, obviously, we've been you know, yeah. guys that have always wanted a lot of play action. And you know what? The Bills ran a ton of it. They ran 51.9% uh, play action against the Chargers. And, you know, the thinking behind that is, you know, get your hands on those defensive line linemen, you know, especially with that run heavy uh, game like they had, you know, scripted uh, play action is supposed to, you know, help them a little more. But the issue with play action and running it at this clip against this defensive front, especially specifically Joy Bosa is typically when you're running play action, you're making it look like a run. You're making it look like you're going to be, you know, helmet down, driving forward and, and run blocking. So those are aggressive pass sets. And when you have an uh, aggressive uh, set, what's going to happen is you're going to get your offensive lineman, whoever it is, up on a defensive lineman quicker. Now, if you have a guy like Joey Bosa going against Daryl Williams and Deion Dawkins even struggled too against Bosa, and you're using those aggressive sets against a Joey Bosa, well, that just allows him to beat that guy quicker one-on-one. -on -one and a shorter line to the quarterback. And we saw that so many times last week. And Brian Dable said it, and you could see it on film. They used Lee Smith. They used Dawson Knox, Gilliam in the backfield on these play-action shots. You know, when they wanted to get those one-on-one -on -one routes outside and, and push the ball down the field, they tried using, you know, their, their tight ends. And it, it didn't always work. It still didn't work. But they did, you know, slide to protections and do things to try to stop Bosa. But he just blew things up. And that's why I said, from the top down, I thought it was a vanilla game plan, but it was it was calculated and and it was to try and limit uh, Joey Bosa, but it just didn't work. He that's why Dia Dawkins said, you know what, I'd vote for him in a pro. He has yeah. my vote because he he, he vote, whooped right? everyone. He whooped everyone yeah. on that defensive line, and we'll see several plays of again Feliciano Winters using aggressive sets, trying to jump set these defensive linemen who are pretty much no name guys, and they're getting smoked with one one, one move. I mean, it just it's nuts how quickly those guys were in Josh Allen's face, and I think. That was part of the game plan going in. Hey, you know, try to get some of these, you know, passes out quickly so that that's not an issue. And I think it was in Josh's head to start. And then once it actually started happening, then they really couldn't push the ball down the field into that uh, intermediate and, and deep area, right? Yeah, and and this is a game with the weather. Like you want to be able to go after the middle of the field, those right. inter intermediate and deep routes, and you can't give your quarter. You would have made Josh Allen a sitting duck putting him back in five and seven step drops and asking him to do what he does best, which is hold the ball for five seconds, let plays develop, 
get scramble rules in effect, and you got three of some of the the, the best trio receivers of trekking back to the football for the quarterback and making themselves available for the quarterback in football. And you miss that when Joey Bose is on the field because you can't put Josh Allen back there and five and seven step drops and have him sit and wait for things to develop in the middle and those in the deep middle and those yeah. deep crossers he loves to run and those deep posts and those deep comebacks. Like that's not stuff that you can do even with good play action against Joey Bosa in this, in this defense. So yeah, you know, they were limited. I mean, let's just, let's be frank. They were limited in their game plan because of a great all pro <clears throat> player on the other side of the ball. And Hey, those guys get paid lots of money too. No doubt. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the film. All right, Nate, first play that we're going to break down is the deep shot to Stefan Diggs and Brian Dable and his post game presser had mentioned that the bills practice this play, this two by two set, against a different coverage. And when they got into the game, they got a totally different coverage. It almost looks to me like they were expecting a single high cover three type look here, just based on the two route combination to the top and to the bottom. These are both really good cover three beaters, but we will see post snap here that the picture changes. You're gonna see uh, Rayshon Jenkins, the safety to the top of the screen and the boundary right here, he drops out right here. And they, the Chargers really drop out into what looks like a quarters coverage look and so Josh looks to the bottom of the screen initially, and those guys are running, again, kind of like a cover three beater. You have a deep cross and then a deep dig by Davis. Really nice routes, but Josh doesn't like those routes, so he throws it deep to digs, and obviously he gets the penalty here. So I want you to talk about Josh's decision here to just throw it deep here early in the game. Again, very aggressive play by the Bills here and Josh Allen. Yeah, I was just going to watch this play out for a second and admire how he just kind of makes a very casual 60, <laughs> 61 yard throw look like a, like he barely transferred his weight from back to front. I mean, Holy cow. Yeah. Um, beyond that, uh, your point about, you know, probably being confused on coverage looks about right. And, and I think what ends up happening is nine times out of 10. How about this? Uh, we're, we're mostly in Josh Allen's world where, you know, he's got his own world. We're living in it. Um, nine times, nine and a half times out of 10, you want him to get the ball to Devin Singletary, let him catch the football, yes. get him upfield for yes. eight, nine yards, maybe 10, 11, 12 with knowing Devin Singletary, making it the first man miss. You want the ball right now, get it to Devin Singletary. There's, you know, eight yards of separation between him and the next defender, lead him, get him upfield, see you on the next play. Yep. But I think, I think, you know, that's just not Josh Allen's DNA. And for better, for worse, uh, it could, a lot of that could be uh, probably pinned on some of the struggles that they can have at times, but, uh, you know, piecing together first downs after starting out really hot, right? Like when Josh can, can sort of hit the layups. This is what people talk about when we're, when we're talking about layups. This is a layup to Devin Singletary. Right. And yet, I think he understands, though, that even though they didn't get the look that they were prepared to get with this route concept, I think, you know, I, I don't know when he recognizes that the corner that's playing in this in this bail technique just kind of stops bail. I mean, he keeps moving, but he's right. not in any hurry. He, it's like he's passing it off to the safety, but isn't sure if he's passing it off to the safety because he doesn't want the guy underneath to catch it and make a play. But his slow play allows for uh, Stefan Diggs to cross the face of the safety. And you you want that matchup against the safety 100 times out of 100 with Stephon Diggs. And gr good on Josh Allen for allowing him to make a play on this. You know, any other quarterback, you know, this first of all, this pro this ball isn't probably thrown because it, the degree of difficulty is 10 out of 10. Um, but if they were 15 yards back, this, this is not out of Josh Allen's range to just loft it up and let Stephon Diggs run under this and for a walk-in touchdown. Um, but they run out of room, uh, even though they're beyond midfield, but that's Josh Allen's range for you. That's a testament to the field isn't long enough for him. Right. right? And, and on this play, he does a great job of holding up a little bit and allowing Stefan Diggs to make a play on the ball and, and not out throw him or throw it in the back of the end zone. So, um, it's good all around. It's risky. Um, it's not the play that would be coached. But a lot of what Josh Allen is not what you what you coach. It's just what, like I said, we're we're in Josh Allen's world. You know, we are we are right. living in it, and for better or for worse. Yeah, and this is what I like uh, about Josh. You can kind of almost see him processing here. Watch Chris Harris to left side. Watch the two linebackers, and then Rayshon Jenkins, who drops out to be that deep uh, quarter player. Watch this little shift that they do. They shift into the boundary, and this is when Josh is watching him. He's like, okay. 
something's amiss here. Something's different here. This is not the look I was expecting. He sees Jenkins dropping out. This is not the cover three look I was expecting. I'm with you. I think he probably could easily just thrown it to Singletary in the flats and gotten four, six, maybe a few more yards. But uh, he does a good job. He notices something's up. Checks checks the safety uh, to the left side of the screen. Then checks Jenkins dropping all the way to that deep half, that deep quarter. And, you know, again, he throws it deep here, and he's got pressure in his face. Brian Winters is kind of the theme of the day. He gets he gets beat inside here, and it's right in Josh Allen's face. And, it, you know, good thing it was a deep drop. And that kind of tells you that Josh was expecting to throw it into the intermediate or deep area too because it usually this – throw to either Knox or to the flats and Singletary is usually the zero to one step drop. It's usually pretty quick. Uh, we see it all the time with Cole Beasley uh, in the slot there on those short spot variation routes in the hook to curl area. But here again, he takes that deep drop. So he kind of decided quite early that he's going to throw deep. He does. And it's a good thing he did. And it's a good thing he was aggressive because he drew the penalty and the bills obviously score on the very next play on the next uh, set of plays here that we're going to break down. All right, Nate, one thing that I've noticed over the first few games of this season is Brian Dable and his staff do a great job of scheming up things in the low red zone, inside the 10, inside the 5. And when they're inside the 5, they're tough to defend because obviously they can run it with Josh Allen right over the top. They got the zone read game, option game, all those things. But what they like to do is bring in several tight ends, you know, H-backs, Ryan Bates. You see an extra tackle right here. It's something they love to do, and they do a lot of shifting, a lot of motioning, you know, presenting issues prior to the snap, presenting that eye candy and getting your eyes to look this way while we throw back across the field that way to, you know, guys like Tyler Croft, Dawson Knox. And it's obviously something the Bills took advantage of, you know, in, in this game uh, against the Chargers, but they have done it almost every game when they get into the low red zone. So I want your thoughts overall on, on Dable's uh, scheming once he gets into that low red zone. Yeah, they get, listen, I mean, Josh Allen is such a weapon as a runner, um, but things we, uh, we've talked about in the past about why Josh Allen has a propensity to just have, sort of bring the best of his game when the sort of situation gets tight. It's that arm strength, right? It's the separating factor um, and, and can really be the difference between, you know, having that success in the red zone or not. You know, a guy like Matt Leiner has to approach throws in the red zone in a very, very different manner than a, you know, a Josh Allen, right? Like guys that, um, you know, don't win with velocity, um, you know, have to win with a certain level of timing that can be hard to execute when things get really confined. And, and one of the things they do in this offense is that, that I really like is when the situation and, and when the, uh, the field gets shortened, especially when they're on one side or the other on a hash where they can get a full field and really get that eye candy and get one the direction of the offensive line and you know a couple of guys going one way and receivers coming back the other yeah. it really creates conflict for those linebackers who are looking at run first and foremost and you have to your first step at the goal line your first step has to be up so you're already playing into a, a weakness of the defense by by moving those linebackers up and when you get a lot of these crossing route concepts you don't have wide receivers standing still um, you're not mm -hmm. looking for zones you're trying to create zones and I think that's the one thing that I really like about Brian Dable and what this offense is, is schemed up when they get inside the five especially the five yard line which is I mean arguably one of the hardest areas in football to be successful consistently yeah, and so let's break down this play to Dawson Knox. It was nice to see him contribute in any way. He, I thought he blocked pretty well in the run game. He obviously you know, shows off his body control and ability to contort his body in the air and make this uh, catch. It's a little high, has some heat on it, but this is the first quarter, second and goal. I love the play design, love the placement in this play. So again, you have an extra offensive lineman and Bates over here on the left side. Knox shifts over to the field here. Now, they're bringing Gilliam across the formation, and so you're going to see number 24 shift with him. Not necessarily because it's man coverage, but they are shifting that guy over. That becomes the passing strength if they are going to pass it. So that guy motions, number 24 motions with him, but now you got to think to yourself, now is it a run? Is it a jet sweep? They can hand it to Gilliam. Or if it's a pass, who has Gilliam going into the flats? And that's where the, the conflict is prior to the snap because the ball snapped where Gilliam basically is just behind the left guard here. And that really conflicts whether it's a run or pass. And then again, the post snap processing of the linebackers and even some of the secondary players. So the run, it looks like a jet sweep. They leave that edge player Bosa unblocked because normally when you run that jet sweep, you're already by that guy. So they leave him unblocked. They send uh, 
Moss at him and Moss cuts him really well. And as you said, they run those crossers. They have Bates going to the front of the end zone. They have Knox get to the back of the end zone. And there are four defenders that jump the route by Gilliam going to the flats here. Four guys jump him. All of their eyes are on him. And that leaves Dawson Knox wide open in the back of the end zone. But Josh is patient uses his eye discipline. He's looking at Bates. He has Lee Smith to the right side, who's kind of being held up by Jenkins, but he takes his time and then eventually rifles it to Dawson Knox. And it is a little high, but I will say one thing, I, anytime I see these backline throws, and this is something that you can talk about, is typically you work on a higher throw in, at the back line because it's almost indefensible. And I remember flashing back to my first year at the Senior Bowl with Josh Allen. He was working on these passes in the back of the end zone. And I was sitting right behind Sean McDermott, Brandon Bean, the entire Bill staff, Leslie Frazier. And we were watching Josh Allen practice these backline throws. And he was literally throwing them five to seven yards over the head of their receivers against air. And they were hitting the back fence. And in a couple of them, it went to the bleachers. I have video evidence of this. It was bad. But talk about the placement here uh, by Josh Allen. Not great. But again, Dawson Knox really shows off that he can make tough catches. He, we just need him to make the easy ones. Oh, right. I, that's perfectly said, dude. Uh, <laughs> just make the easy ones, damn it. Um, yeah, placement, you know, it's a little behind the receiver and a little high. And that's always worrisome when you're talking about a play at the back line where you're running out of real estate and you, you're you relying on the athleticism of your receiver. And hey, I, I think the Bills have some of the most athletic receivers in the game. Um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, athletic profiles from tight ends, I mean, Dawson Knox is going to be right up there <clears throat> in terms of just overall athletic. Uh, pros. Right. So like, you know, that that's a guy you want there and, and, and good on him for making the play. But as a quarterback, you need to try a little bit um, to make this easier that, you know, this should be one of those situations that, you know, if you're grading the throw, um, I would think that you're probably going to throw a lower grade on that just based on where the ball location is. But I, I like the point that you made out too, is when you get here, now you're talking about defensive line when they're getting their hands up and, yeah. and you're talking about a compressed area. Sometimes you have to keep the ball elevated in order to get the ball over the hands of these defenders. Yep. So uh, there's a lot of play um, the, at the end of the day. The only one that scores that shows up on the score sheet is one for the touchdown. So yes, no, I again, top to bottom. I love the play design. I don't mind the execution. You saw the guys defensive line, um, the lineman's hands go up. And again, if this is tighter coverage, there's a guy in trail like we saw uh, with KJ Wright trailing Tyler Croft, typically these throws are higher so that that guy cannot bat it down while he's in trail technique on these deep crossing routes on these crossing routes in the back of the end zone. So again, uh, Brian Dable said that you know when they practice this uh, it, during the week they got a different look and he, you know Knox wasn't wide open but he didn't get his feet in. Well here he does and you know it's a it's a game that I I think a lot of Bills fans want to see you know games like this from Knox. You know, they want more from this guy, and I think it, it's going to come. It's going to come a little later than most people expect, but he is playing tight end. It's one of those positions that takes a little while to develop. But either way, good play for the touchdown. All right, Nate, first quarter, 152 left on the clock, third and nine situation, so third and long. And the Bills uh, and Josh Allen, I think Josh Allen kind of locks in the Beasley here who's in uh, to the top of the screen here in this three-by-one set, and he really misses Gabriel Davis to the bottom of the screen. So, I want I want to ask you, Nate. I mean, does this look like a one or two high safety set? It's it's definitely a two high safety set. And as we know in the EP system, more times than not, especially on critical downs, Brian Dable's gonna give Josh, you know, two different coverage yep. beaters. And on this play, it's a it, like you said, it's a two high safety set, and it's pretty obvious that they're in some some sort of box coverage, which is a traditional check against uh trips bunch sets. This is uh this is, I mean, to a T, a textbook look of a cover six box set to the top of the screen, which means to the bottom, you have Jenkins is the safety, two high safety shell, and cornerback Davis is down there squatting uh, in the flats there. And the Bills to the top of the screen, they basically have, again, another single high coverage beater with Beasley running just a little curl route, obviously not even near the sticks here. And to the bottom, Gabriel Davis is running a deep corner route, and I believe he's wide open. And Josh, again, kind of stares Beasley down to the top of the screen when he shouldn't be looking at this single high safety beater. His eyes should have been down to the bottom as Davis kind of breaks here to the corner. And I think with that cover two or that two high safety look, Josh may have a better shot of anticipating this throw and dropping it into the honey hole. Now, the issue with this is he starts his delivery, looks to Beasley, but he also has pressure pretty quickly uh, right in his face off Brian Winters. And that guy creates pressure and Josh 
basically he basically pulls it down right around 2.7 to 83 seconds and we'll see from the end zone angle it's a bad decision because he, as he's going down he's attempting to throw it to Beasley still when Harris is plastered down on him so bad decision bad eye discipline from the from the start I want to get your thoughts on this play from top to bottom yeah, and you know, first and foremost, I, I can't blame him, especially in a play like this where the ball's got to come out quick. He never gets back to the, to the, uh, you know, to the side of the field that he should get to. But I think part of your exercise at the beginning there is IDing the number of safeties here. Yes. Because of that, you have to understand, as Josh Allen, that the left side of the field, your trip side of the field, is covered. Um, it is four against three. Yeah. So with, with knowing that they have numbers to that side of the field and you have a design where the running backs coming out of the backfield here, you immediately should be starting to the right side of the field, not Absolutely. starting left and, and getting to the right. But I also can't blame Josh Allen and those, he sees pressure. Mm -hmm. You know who he's thinking? He's thinking, who's the guy? It's Cole Beasley on third down. I mean, he's your guy on third down. You know, he's dependable. You know, he's going to find an opening, even if he's slightly covered. He's going to find, he's going to make himself available to you. So I can't blame the mindset, but defenses are going to prey on, the, on that mindset. And they, they did that here. Um, I, the pressure definitely hurts his ability yeah. to, to get to where he needs to go. But I think pre-snap, he needs to be starting right, unless he's starting left to keep the safety. But he doesn't need to based on the coverage. So especially to the to the bottom side of the field where you show that Gabe Davis is open, you know yeah. that two-verse-two, two, you've got to go for the two-verse-two two opposed to the three-verse-four look. Um, and, and understanding that pre-snap would allow him to the start to the right, maybe – Maybe he doesn't have time to let that develop, and that's probably right. But what you want to see is from a processing perspective that he's st at least starting right. And if the pressure's there and he gets sacked, at least we know he was looking to the right place and he ID'd the coverage properly. But what you're pointing out and what I think you know, ultimately I'm getting a point to here is he didn't ID it properly. Um, he went to sort of his safe you know, yes. uh, tendency, which – he's got to be careful of doing because that will come back to haunt him. His third and nine is not a Beasley down either. Third and three, no, third, and four, correct. third and five, yes. But this, and that's, again, if he was on the, you know, the proper side, if his eyes were the proper side, you know, it's something he talked about in the off season. You know, I got to eliminate what coverage they're not in. And he mm -hmm. didn't eliminate that. They. This is obviously, obviously not a single high coverage look. His eyes need to be to the right side of the of the field for him uh, to Davis. So I just didn't like. And then he adds insult to injury and, and throws it on his way down when that guy's you know covered down. Everyone's covered from the get go, and then he, he just makes it worse. I thought right here. So I just didn't like the you know the process from pre to post snap. He almost, as you said, like he kind of locked in on his man, which uh, great. Yeah. Beasley's his guy, no doubt about it. But in certain situations, on third and nine, when he's running a, a you know a little curl route, you know four or five, six yards on the field, that's not going to do it when you got four over three. That's right. Yeah, and it's just like I said, it, what it is is a pre-step understanding and what the defense isn't doing. But what you have to understand is just and 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 an easy way to do this is just understand the concept of of your matchups, the numbers, four versus three or two versus two. You take the one on one matchups all day, and you know you're not getting one on one on the other side, it's going to be a zone. So as long as you can occupy that corner, which the running back ultimately does, it opens up that throw. But, you know, we might even, we might be nitpicking a little bit only yeah. because if he's sitting in the pocket and he does start right, his best option is to immediately run a field. And, you know, he, this was a bad play from execution up, up front and from processing pre-snap. Shoulder, and, shoulders up issue for yep. me. This is not a, you know, bad throw. No, this is a shoulders up processing thing, like you said. And yes, of course this, I mean, you know, Brian Winters, Winters getting smoked. Yeah, yeah Brian Winters out. getting smoked early in this game doesn't help his mind, uh, Josh Allen's mindset going forward either. And that's, again, something we talked about and leading into Jerry, that team. Jerry Tillery is a nice player. He's, I, you know, I've, I've watched him all, all three years at Notre Dame or four years at Notre Dame. Um, he's a guy that can move. So, you know, like those, those guys up front, they can move. Is that Tillery, right? 90? No, I think 99 no, no, no. right here 99 is, Tillery, is Tillery, yeah. yeah, 99 Tillery. Yeah, he, he's a nice player. But no, it's, uh, again, you know, the defense gets paid too, but you, you need your offensive line. You need your, those, especially the interior guys. When you're facing Joey Bosa, you've got enough on your plate. You can't have your interior guys breaking down this easily um, on a play like this. No doubt about it, man. So just, again, shoulders up issue here for me, uh, but he didn't get any help from his offensive line. All right, Nate, we are in the second quarter, 1231 on the clock, first and 10 situation. The Bills are going to run a little play action pass into the boundary to the top of the screen. 
And this is a play where Josh tries throwing it to Dawson Knox as he slips out into the boundary. And I like his decision, even though he's under pressure pretty quickly. I like his decision to throw this, but my issue is the placement. I want to see him throw Dawson Knox open. As you see here, Dawson Knox kind of runs into the boundary. That's fine. You know, he's running his route, kind of curling into the and, and running right here into the boundary. He's got a defender underneath him. But what he doesn't have is someone protecting deep. I want Josh to throw it over here. This defender is that cover three defender that matches those deep crossers. So as Diggs gets across here and is that decoy, the safety is going to drop with him. His back's to the uh, pass to Dawson Knox. So I want to see Josh throw it down the field a little more, throw him open, throw to green, as I always say. And he doesn't, floats it up there into the boundary, and it's almost intercepted. So I want you to talk about uh, the decision here by Josh and, of course, the placement. Yeah, I mean, pressure's right on him right away again, yeah. um, which makes this play difficult. And, you know, by design, you're reaching down on this play and it's play action. And, you're, you know, the defensive end wasn't delayed enough. Um, and not only that, but your break guard loses his one-on-one -on -one again. And, and right. you know, when you get these guys losing their one-on-one -on -one battles up front, um, it makes it difficult for the quarterback in this instant to make an accurate throw. But to your point, where he's where he's got to go, and and it's the situational and 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 sort of leverage awareness in this play where you need Josh to understand like, hey, uh, look where this corner is right now, and look where Dawson Knox is, yeah. and look where the nearest defender is. And now I, I know we're, we're asking a lot for him, of him in this moment when he's got a one-on-one -on -one battle in front of him that has just completely broken free in that defensive tackle. He's also got a, a defensive end as a free rusher coming on the left side right right away. So. You know, I guess part of this is any quarterback is going to have a difficult time while that's happening, IDing what's happening here. But where I want his eyes, if he knows he's going to Dawson Knox, which I think right here he knows that he knows. he's going, he's got to understand the leverage of the corner. You can't, you know, he ends up throwing it to the sideline where the leverage of the defender is taking him. Yeah, he can recover. Um, Right. So you want to you want to make this harder on the defender. And based on where his hips are, he can't turn around to get that depth. And look where 23 is. If you put yeah. it in between the numbers and the sidelines midway through um, you, at the 40, 45 yard line and you put a little loft under the ball. Um, I mean, you might be talking about six um, with the way that Dawson. Exactly, that man. Yeah. And that, that's the thing. A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, you're probably nitpicking here. No, because Josh, he processes this perfectly. As I showed you guys, like if you watch the beginning of the play here, he's looking at that safety. He's making sure that guy is going to carry digs on that deep over route. He checks it quickly. And uh, yes, he has pressure in his face, but he look, quickly looks to Knox right here and decides I'm going to throw it to him. He knows that safety is not going to make a play on this. Throw him open, throw him up the field, not into the boundary. He can do it. He's got the arm strength. And I just want to see him process the leverage better on this play. It's something you kind of talked about in the last play of processing numbers, the yep. numbers advantage or disadvantage on that three by one set. Well, this one's more of a leverage issue here. Throw the guy open. He's got leverage up the field and inside, not outside and into the boundary, right? Yeah. And, you know, there's there, he's got the versatility in the way that he can throw with the football he doesn't have to make it a loft. He can throw it to his left shoulder, you know, force him to turn back around, make it almost like a back shoulder where you're taking his leverage back towards the numbers. And he has the ability to do that. Not many yeah. guys do. So yeah, it's just an understanding of, Hey, his hips are facing the sideline. Why am I going to give him an opportunity to make a play the way that he's leveraged? Use it against him. All right. Now second quarter, seven thirty-eight on the clock, second and eight situation. Bills are inside their 20 yard line here. Uh, they have a tight end in the backfield, running back in the backfield. They're running a little play action. And this this is your typical, you know, howitzer throw by Josh Allen. From right around the 10-yard line, he's going to hit Gabriel Davis to the bottom of the screen on a stop route uh, from the right hash, outside the numbers, damn near into the boundary here. Um, a rope. I mean, just a hell of a throw. And a lot of people from the broadcast angle say, look at how high that pass is. You know, the location was off. The placement was off. But if you look at it from the end zone angle, guys, you're going to see why that pass was a little high. Josh has to throw this up and over the defensive lineman. So his ability to generate velocity, but also, you know, the release point, changing that release point. It's incredibly uh, difficult to block or bat down a pass like this when you have a guy as big as Josh and then a guy that can elevate the release point up high to get it up and, up and over, as we saw already in this breakdown. Uh, the defensive lineman. So, Nate, talk about this throw and the arm talent. I mean, we there's like two or three of these throws almost every week, especially on these, you know, deep comebacks or deep stop routes, right? 
Yeah, and you know, I think you can't make this throw a quarter of a second later than he makes it. He has to, I mean, first of all, if he does, he's getting killed. And secondly, um, he has to, he's making this throw as Gabriel Davis is making his break, which creates the separation needed to allow him to make this catch without getting killed. I mean, this isn't open for a lot of guys. In fact, it's open, not really, you know, not a lot of guys are making this throw. The elite throwers in the, in, in the NFL are making this type of throw. I mean, this is throwing a guy open. Yeah. Um, and there is one or two yards of, se- of separation. Gabe Davis generally isn't a big separation guy in terms of raw speed, but he creates enough separation at the top of his route, but it's, it's all arm talent. I mean, that's just as good as it gets. Um, and your point about, you know, a little bit high too, that's frankly, that's also going to give the opportunity for the uh, offensive player to protect himself in this situation. Gabriel Davis can get up, get his, uh, you know, get his body under him and, and potentially protect himself from taking a big hit. So, um, uh, it's a great play, but the arm talent is the thing that pops for me. Yeah. And you talk about separation. He's not a really a guy that's going to separate with his speed per se, but his, his arm length, his wingspan and, you know, on throws like this. And obviously we're going to break down one later where he uses uh, <laughs> insane uh, body control to, 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 you know, reel in that pass along the sideline as well. Uh, this is a way for a guy like him to separate. You know, while it was good coverage at the top of the route, he separates, works back to the ball. Josh is able to release the ball from the right hash up and over the defensive lineman for the first down to Gabriel Davis. All right, second quarter, 6-0-7 on the clock, second and 10 situation, and Bills run their pin and pull RPO. This is something I've been, you know, clamoring for for the longest time now, especially after analyzing the Bills run game. You know, they have not pulled their offensive linemen as much as I would have liked thus far uh, this season. It's one of the issues I thought they've had, but pairing it with an RPO is even better with how often, you know, defenses have blitzed that slot corner or, or played just, you know, simple coverages. So, Pin pull run, two offensive linemen are pulling. They're reading a defender in the middle of the field, reading that linebacker. That linebacker shoots up into his run gap, and Josh is reading him. It's called the conflict defender. So post-snap, you're going to see Josh, as those linemen pull, you see his eyes on that linebacker, that hook-to-curl linebacker. That's the conflict defender. And the conflict is, should I run? Should I fill versus the run, or should I drop to my zone if it's a pass? And that guy is going to slow play the run right there, and, he had, and Josh has a throw to Cole Beasley over the middle. So t- tell me what you love about these RPOs, especially this slant to Cole Beasley over the middle. What I love is they're damn near impossible to defend. And, you know, maybe, Eric, they're holding off their RPO game for the playoffs um, because I think this is an offense that can build a game plan around it, um, yeah. a week-to-week game plan that can work, especially when you don't have John Brown. I think it's a great equalizer. And on this play, it's win-win. You've got this – if if Josh could – give this and you've got numbers you got Deion Dawkins and you've got Mitchell Morris running in front of you um with two much smaller defenders that you can either a cut or get a hat on and you're like your chances with yeah. you're off to the races yep. um and on this play the the defenders in an impossible decision from the linebacker um that that window is just wide open I mean he's got five yards in every direction um of separation and 10 yards to the linebacker so right. you know I think this is the type of play where run it until they can stop it. And I'm not sure that based on, you know, how this play set up and especially the formation, I think the formation is great because you get the down block from Dawson Knox to freeze up, um, you know, the freeze up Deion Dawkins to be able to get out there. I love those numbers yeah. um, uh, out on the edge with, with Zach Moss. I, I love that a lot. So especially with how good Gabriel Davis is at blocking um, you, you love those numbers a lot. That that's a big play either way you spin it. Um, but you know, for me, I just want to see more of it. I want to see it in volume. I want to see them when they're in the third quarter and they're looking to, they got to get that score to fend the other team off. Start to start a drive, um, you know, having this a drive starter, make this a routine at some part of your offense. I just don't see enough of it week to week. And, you know, I think this, this could be a huge weapon with who you have at quarterback. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I'm glad they, they did run several different types of RPOs and even PROs, pass run options, mm-hmm. uh, where, you know, Josh is looking to the screen. They don't have, they don't have the numbers advantage. He's just this running is, it. Yeah, just little things like I that, man. This. I love this as a wrinkle and as an answer to a lot of the zero blitz, um, uh, especially when you, you talked about when they're blitzing their slot defender. Um, I love this as, as almost a go-to, as, as almost your black call, right? Like you have a color that you can go yeah, to live you know color. Yeah. Go, right. A live color call that you're going to and saying, that's the move. 
Um, like I, that, that's the type of thing where they did it at another point of the game too, early on. Um, they ran a, uh, I think one of the very few times that the Chargers ended up blitzing, they ran a little screen behind them and it was a beautiful, beautiful, I think it was the only screen they probably ran all day, but I, I, I'm, I digress. What I'm saying is this is a great type of simple um, go-to type of play that really conflicts a defense. And, you know, I just would like to see the more simplistic version of this, this play specifically, and more pulling to your point. They've got athletic guys. And I think part of the reason that they're struggling a little bit is they're stationary. Um, let's get them moving a little. Yes, and this is, uh, I mean, as you said, they have a numbers advantage uh, if they were to run it here, but they also have a numbers advantage, you know, uh, to the, a leverage advantage uh, to the field here. Because again, that safety, you see him just outside the hash, but he's way off of, of Cole Beasley here. Uh, and of course, this linebacker is in conflict here, but this is, you know, the other safety right here. He's in the box to help defend this run. And as you said, they you could really make the case that there's a hat on a hat out there as well. And so... This is what we need to see more of, and there's it's it's no surprise that the Bills had, uh, you know, they had success running the ball on these pin and pull runs, on those runs where you're getting Mitch Morse and those offensive linemen, Deion Dawkins on the perimeter. It's no surprise the Bills had one of their better run days uh, against the Chargers because they did that. And then you add this wrinkle of RPOs. That's when this offense, like you said, can get very dangerous with Josh Allen at quarterback. All right, Nate, so something the Bills have seen uh, the last few games has been cover three match, a uh, Rip Liz concept. You hear, you hear me talk about it all the time, something Nick Saban is really good at, kind of the godfather of this uh, concept. So to the bottom of the screen, you're going to see a typical, you know, cover three type look, zone look. But to the top, the safety Jenkins and the corner into the boundary are matching the two receivers to the top of the screen here, Dawson Knox and Stefan Diggs. Now, if those guys were to run vertical, it's going to be man to man coverage. But what you're going to see here is Dustin Knox running that deep over out with a pulling guard on the backside. So they're running a little play action. It's a really nice read and decision by Josh Allen because as he looks to get at the Knox here, Knox is covered because uh, the safety right here kind of carries him just a little bit. He's got depth. And you're going to see Diggs right here just sit on the numbers as that safety kind of bails out right there. And Josh moves on from Knox with the two linebackers underneath and hits Diggs right on the numbers. So... Only a few yards, but I love the process by Josh Allen. So what are your thoughts on this play? Yeah, same. I, I love how he ultimately gets back to the to the right side of the field, makes an accurate throw to dig. It's a simple play, but it's it's good because he he really he reads the full field here and he's understanding. We we talked about the leverage of defenders and we talked about understanding numbers and um, this defense is gonna be something they see more of. So uh, you know, in this game, this is a good answer to that. And and not only that, but it, Stephon Diggs pretty trusty on the other end of it. We're in the third quarter here, 4.45 on the clock, first and 10 situation. Bills, what they did in the run game kind of tied in pretty well in the play-action game. We talked about how much play-action they ran. They ran this uh, three-by-one set, motion Lee Smith to the top of the screen and showed that outside zone look, which they've had some success over the last few games with. But this time, they're going to run play-action off of it. They're going to have uh, Feliciano peel back and hit Cole Beasley. Uh, right outside the numbers to the bottom of the screen. Just a really nice touch pass from Josh Allen and designed by Brian Dable. I just love how Josh Allen, you know, goes through the process. Here comes the motion with Lee Smith. Again, showing that same run look they've had success with in this game, especially get those linebackers at the second level to, you know, to really bite up. You see this linebacker get blocked by uh, Lee Smith right here. He comes downhill so much. So gets that, you know, that good sell here. Feliciano peels back. Now Josh has a good pocket. And just watch that little hop, that rotation of his hips and core here. That little hop right there to swing that back hip through so that he can have an accurate pass with touch to Cole Beasley. So talk about this play, design, and then just Josh Allen's execution on this play to Cole Beasley. Thing of beauty, I love the peel back block here from because it really sells the run really well. And you have a free defender, you're designing a free defender by by that self fake. So I just love the peel back. It's a great design um, to make a nice clean pocket. You love that matchup, a defensive back against John Feliciano. It's uh, you know it, that, that that's just a great setup to this play. And then obviously you get Cole Beasley running wide open, and you love 
you know, one of the things that used to be that we would talk about with Josh Allen on this play is he would wait to make this throw. Yeah. And because he throws on time with anticipation and it gets rid of the football, leads the leads the receiver, puts it in a place that he can catch it and turn up field, you know, he turns this into a first down play. I just a lot of times he's waiting until he hits the number and he's turning this into a, a, a harder throw than it needs to be at the sideline, moving away from himself. And these are just plays that he simplified himself, simplified his technique and his mechanics. Um, and and just deliver a really nice. This is the this is a very easy layup type of play that we talk about. That you know in years past he had trouble hitting. So it, you, you like to see the development on this play, and and I think this is the culmination of of a lot of things, but technique more than anything um, of getting rid of the ball on time and on target. Third quarter, three fifteen on the clock, third and three situation. There's a play where the Chargers play cover one, and the matchup of the day was Harris versus Beasley. And I thought Josh Allen stared Beasley down a little too long on this play. He's just running an out route. It's a middle of the field route, a uh, middle of the field read for Josh Allen. If Beasley is not open, which more times than not he is, Josh would be hitting Dawson Knox on the inbreaker right here. But of course there are guys underneath uh, defending that as well. So he's really relying on Cole Beasley to separate. He's not even looking at this go route right here by Davis, which probably could have been, uh, you know, down the field for a touchdown here. His hands up. But Harris did a great job disrupting Cole Beasley in the slot at the top of this route. It's a really good route, but Harris does enough to really slow him up when Josh wants to throw it. And Josh has to hold on to the ball, and that's when Bosa comes in and, I mean, nearly strips the ball from Josh Allen. But either way, uh, forces fourth down. So what are your thoughts on this play from Josh Allen and uh, his eye discipline, man? I thought he stared down Beasley far too many times on Sunday. Yeah, uh, third and three. Yep. tendency we talked mm -hmm. about it earlier um because for me based on the coverage pre-snap i know it's third and three but i'm going to go route all day and the ball's out right now it's out right now it's out on that third step and i'm leading i'm leading um gabriel davis to the 35 yard line or the 25 yard line and he's walking into the end zone um so for me right there balls out and he's yeah. got the separation to, that you can make that throw. He's waiting and waiting and waiting for Cole Beasley because he's looking for the first down, and I get it. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's your guy on third and short. Even you said earlier when I was like, hey, at the, the other play we talked about, that's not really a Cole Beasley area. This is. This, I mean, is. this is. This is his. This is his. He's taking his lunch pail out. This is where he does his nine to five work. Um, but to your point, Chris Harris shut him down. Yeah. Um, and on this play, um, I, I mean, he's got Cole Beasley guessing. Um, and that's really tough to do when you're Cole Beasley. But right here, um, you got to just know based on the coverage, one-on-one, -on -one, I know you like your matchup with Cole Beasley, but how Chris Harris is playing all game and what you got from a matchup standpoint on the outside, give Gabriel Davis a shot and, uh, and, and let's see if you can put it in for six. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, again, I, I, I mean, I don't know if he's an alert on that play, if he's even an option or he's just clearing out for Cole Beasley. But I think Josh just stares Beasley, uh, you know, down too long, but, one little nitpick on the backside of this route. Uh, you will see Stefan Diggs run into that short in-breaking route, but and he's running it right at the sticks. He gets that guy turned around. He does separate. But my issue is with Josh looking to the bottom of the screen, I think Diggs needs to carry this route into Josh's line of view. Obviously, this is an extension of the play from the pocket. You know, go go make yourself QB friendly. Get, get his eyes on you by crossing the field. He stops, and as... As Bosa closes in, you see it better from the end zone angle here. As Bosa closes in, where does Josh's eyes go? And it's a little late, but he looks back to Diggs right here. And Diggs is standing still not doing anything. I want to see him get across the field. Maybe Josh somehow can lob it up and over to Diggs here. Watch as Diggs gets the eyes of Josh Allen here. Then he's like, oh, man, now I'm live. Nope, too late. So a nitpick, but that's just something from Diggs. I want to see him become a little more QB friendly. Maybe it's only a half field read on this play on third and short, especially because of the drop. It's a short drop, uh, but I want to see Diggs become QB friendly and help his quarterback especially here. Especially to Josh Allen. Yeah, yeah, Josh no doubt, Allen, man. The play's never over. It's never a half field read with Josh Allen. All right, Nate, we're in the fourth quarter, 10 0 8 on the clock, first and 10 situation. I love the, the use of cadence by Josh. I wonder if it's something that he worked on, uh, you know, in the bye week. I do remember one of the coaches mentioning it in the press conference, but he does get a free play here because of that cadence. And I love his field awareness and how he scans the field on his play. He takes a shot deep to Gabriel Davis. So a great lead in to the last play, you know, get rid of the ball to Gabe Davis here. He does, he gives his guy a shot down the field as the Chargers drop into uh, more of a quarters coverage look here. 
He gets one-on-one -on -one with that corner. Gabriel Davis does to the top of the screen and throws it to the outside shoulder of Gabriel Davis. And then Davis just does the rest, separates at the catch point. And just that body control, man, it's something we've talked about in several breakdowns. I remember, you know, going back to the Rams game where he was making these catches and then rotating his body, protecting the ball, and then yeah. getting right back in the stride, man. Like this is, I don't, I don't know if you guys understand how difficult that is. That just a great play from he Josh almost, Allen, man. And then obviously Gabriel Davis, it. almost, he, almost, that dude. Corner made a shoestring tackle. If he would have house called it, that would have been an insane. Just the, the you're, you're right. It is like ability to contort himself while he's in the air, but come down so soft. That it, it like allow it's like a springboard when he gets off the ground after jumping. It's 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 remarkable the the quick twitch type athlete because he doesn't look like it. No. Um, but when he's twisting in the air, he makes himself available. He goes up and gets it. This was on you got mossed on ESPN for Monday Night Football, which you love to see. <laughs> um, yeah, this was this was a fantastic play, great throw, a nice little Rogers special. Um, you know, knowing that you got a free play at worst. Um, you, you, you might even, you know, you're going to look at a pass interference or you're, um, you know, you're getting, getting a big play either way. Look at that ball placement. It's, it's nuts, elite. man. That's phenomenal. Yeah. It's just great. And again, I don't think Josh was intending to go to Davis on this play. He gets the free play call right there and initially looks to digs uh, on the left side of the screen here. It's kind of off the screen there, but look at him scan the field. I mean, he, I mean, with Bosa coming off the edge, he quickly scans both sides of the field. All right. I'm going to take my shot with this free play. Hang in, as, hang in there as long as I can and then just throw it up and give his guy a shot. And, man, I, I, I can't get enough of Gabriel Davis going up and getting these passes and getting right back in the stride. This it just almost It's almost impossible to replicate this. Like, this is just a, a sick play by Davis. Unreal body control to turn and get back in stride here. Uh, good shot play and obviously one of the longer plays down the field. Uh, for the Bills on the day, and they needed some of these shot plays, you know, even though the one to Diggs didn't really count, they needed a couple of those to really kind of, you know, lift that coverage up a little bit so they could run the ball uh, with how much cover three and cover four that the Chargers were playing. All right, fourth quarter, 646 on the clock, second and 12 situation here. So obviously a quarter that was marred with, you know, interceptions, fumbles, and this is the interception uh, by Josh Allen. You know, it kind of fades away on a play. It's an off-platform throw, but I am i don't mind the decision, and you'll see why here, because as he's getting ready to throw it, his timing on it's good. It's a sick route by Diggs, and he does separate right here, and Josh is anticipating the throw here. He's kind of fading back, but he's just loading, loading, giving – you know, digs just that extra second to separate it, you know, into the boundary. But as he is starting his delivery, Chris Harris, who blitzed from the bottom of the screen, gets a piece of his elbow or forearm, and it does make the ball flutter and it's intercepted here. But I want to get your thoughts on this play because it does look, it looked ugly from the broadcast angle. But I think when you look at it from this and kind of, you know, go through the process from Josh Allen, uh, you realize that. You know, maybe it wasn't such a bad decision and he's trusting Diggs on this play, kind of like he did in the Dolphins game where he threw it up uh, into the boundary and, and Diggs, you know, alpha the guy, went up and got it and, and bailed him out. Kind of similar play and route here, but obviously this one, the ball kind of flutters because of Chris Harris's uh, deflection here and it's intercepted. So what are your thoughts on this play, Nate? First and foremost, let's not, uh, you know, let's not pin this on Daryl Williams either. I mean, that's just a, it's a corner with significantly better foot speed than you. He gets to the outside and you're running back bails for, a, uh, to get out, uh, on a pattern. So yeah. I, I'm not going to, I'm not, I, it looked bad in real time. Like yeah. It looked like Daryl Williams whiffed, but uh, that, that's just, that's a tough play for Daryl Williams. Tough play for any tackle, uh, with the foot speed you have coming around the edge on that, and that slap blitz. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. I love the processing on this. Um, the, the route by Diggs is filthy. Um, he, it, it looks exactly like every single, it looks like a stock over route. Yeah. Um, both and, of these, right. Both of these look like they're selling that crossing route. It, it's and especially beautiful. When, you, when you watch Diggs head, um, when you play it back at yeah. just like he's going on, uh, it's just such a fantastic route. And, and it, 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 if Chris Harris isn't there, this is probably a catch and he's walking out of bounds and we're talking about what a great throw it is. I just think it's, you know, a matter of seconds and, and, you know, kudos to the defense. Yeah, no doubt about it, man. I love the design of this play and it's almost like they saved it for, you know, this type of situation, a second long situation. Um, a lot of people, you know, were dinging Josh Allen for the decision, the interception, but I, I really think that there's a play to be made here. If Chris Harris doesn't get a piece of his arm, I think this is actual, uh, you know, this could be, 
uh, a completion. So I don't mind the decision. I think the uh, the execution was just lacking because Chris Harris got a piece of it. All right, Nate. So there's some good and bad there. And as I said, you saw from some of those plays, some of them were designed very nicely. Some of them just lacked execution. Some of them were just better plays by the Chargers defense. And a lot of these plays, even the ones that Josh did complete, you saw him under duress and you saw him have to make plays. And Josh is a playmaker at, at heart. I mean, you're not going to coach that out of him, and we don't want that coach out of him. So while you saw that interception on that last play, and from the broadcast angle, it looked a lot worse, no doubt about it. Uh, I want you to talk about, you know, Josh Allen, the playmaker, um, because, uh, again, we didn't, we don't really want to ding him too much for trying to make that play because I think there was a play to be made, as I think you do agree. So talk about, you know, th that interception and just some of the turnovers, even in that fourth quarter, you know, yeah. trying to pick up that bobble snap which if he picks it up and he looks down the field and it doesn't try to run it, you can make the case that McKenzie's wide open on the deep over yep. route. So the playmaker, Josh Allen, what are your thoughts on him in this game and how it kind of kind of hurt the Bills in the fourth quarter, but we want him to continue to play like that, right? Yeah, I mean, you've got to ride with some of those because that's a, it's a high-risk play on that fumble. And that's what you love about Josh Allen. And a lot of times that goes right. And Josh picks it Cowboys up. Cowboys game? An right. He makes an athletic play. And yeah, your coach to jump on it. But again, where it, this is Josh Allen's world. It's just, he's, he's a different type of guy. He's just a different type of, of uh, a professional athlete and, and a different kind of makeup mentally. And um, yeah, like I don't want to ding him on plays like that. And I think for me moving forward this season, um, you know, when you play, when, when we see a, a hesitant Josh Allen, um, that's when he's got to start to worry. And I think as long as he understands and believes in what he's seeing, that when he's making a throw like that, it's no big deal to him. And he knows he's not coming off to the sideline. It's not Carson Wentz, guys. I mean, this guy isn't coming off to the sideline having to worry about whether or not a rookie quarterback that took him the second round is ready to take his job. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and this coaching staff believes in him. And in and a, and a play like that, um, you definitely don't want it because that's, who, that's what makes Josh Allen who he is. And, yeah. and, and only a couple of people in the league can make you know, that throw or pick up a fumble and try to still make a positive out of it. So um, we don't want to, you know, neuter them, but at the same time, you know, we do want to continue to see growth. And I think we have seen growth in, I don't want to use boneheaded, but just like those, ah, damn it, Josh. Like, you know, we haven't, we're seeing those plays in far less frequency. And I think that's the growth wet that a lot of us wanted to see. Yeah, and I mean, we will see them from time to time, kind of like the one we saw early in the breakdown where he was in the grasp, he was going down, he's throwing. Like, you don't want to see plays like that, but you know, it, he has gotten better at limiting those plays and not stringing those plays together. And I, I am okay with what he did with the fumble. Um, you know, if he picks that up, if Brian Winters doesn't kick it out, he probably could be running for a few yards. Or, again, if he just drops back and he saw the coverage, McKenzie's wide open over the middle on the crosser, um, and then that play to Diggs, that interception, that last play breakdown, I, I, I don't mind that decision. He's under dress. He's trying to make a play. Yes, I understand the situation, how they're up on the scoreboard and all that stuff, but he's also trying to put the game away, which is what we want from our offense. You know, you know, they were running the ball well, and then, again, they had some turnovers, so they went – and try to you know save the play for when they want to put the game away with that fake those fake crossing routes and blaze outs uh, dual blaze outs and they were open both of them were open he was underdressed tried making a play I don't have a problem with that at all trying to put the game away with how the defense was playing it's all good in my book um, but you know we're here to break plays down down and you know show it a little nuance and so um, we that's why we broke these plays down so going forward man. Uh, what do you want to see from Brian Dable, Josh Allen, this uh, this offense? Because obviously that game plan was a little different, run heavy, and obviously it was a little vanilla. But again, I think we kind of pinpoint exactly why it was vanilla. And it wasn't just Joey Bosa getting in on uh, and pressuring Josh Allen. It was also some of those interior defenders. So what do you want to see from the Bills offense going forward, especially against uh, San Francisco 49ers next week? I know that they'll never tell us the truth, but they say that the players the players definitely don't look ahead the players look to the next game and the next opponent and that's all that matters but don't you dare let a coach persuade you in thinking that they don't have a bigger picture at play and i think the bigger picture of not showing too much in a matchup like this and next week against a banged up 49ers team that you know they're a little confident because they got a great coach and a great play caller but they know what defense lies in a few weeks on, on Sunday night. They know that the Pittsburgh Steelers, the number one defense in football, um, on, on Sunday night football in a matchup of an undefeated football team, uh, how much do you want to give up 
Um, and and this in that game against a three and seven football team, and then the following game against a banged up 49ers team. Um, against a, a 49ers defense that plays almost an identical scheme to what they just saw. Exactly right. That cover and, three Seattle arc, you know, that that's the that's a scheme that they're basically seeing back to back weeks. And I think they'll have better success this week because I think the offensive line will have a better opportunity to hopefully win some more one-on-one. Javon Kinlaw, though, is a really good player. Yeah. Um, I, I liked him a lot coming out of college. He's yeah. a really good player. Um, so they're, they, they've got their work cut out, but not quite Joey Bosa, though. No, no doubt about it. So, uh, and, of course, the Niners are dealing with some injuries, so it'll be interesting to see. Again, similar scheme. You know, maybe they don't have the pass rusher of Joey Bosa, but I'd like to see a little more um, than just that vanilla game plan that we saw against Great. the Chargers. So, um, what you got? What do you have going on this week at WGR, man? Uh, and uh, what can we expect from you? And where can we find you on Twitter? Uh, at Nick Erie Sports on Twitter, my Sports Talk Saturday slot. Um, I'll have this week been having uh, our buddy Greg on a bunch um, lately. So um, yeah, we'll be uh, rolling back on Saturday. I'll get to kick my feet up again and watch football wow. on Sunday on my couch. And that's I'm looking right. forward to that. Um, yeah, otherwise that's, uh, that's what I got rolling. I'll have my, uh, my normal column, for, uh, Monday night after, well, and I'll actually probably be on Tuesday morning, um, next week. So you can, uh, keep an eye out for that at wgr 550com Awesome. Yeah. I'll be trying to, uh, do some more film work from this game and maybe even some Niners footage later in the week, uh, because of the extended week and then the game on uh, Monday night. So I'll try to do some breakdowns for you guys for the YouTube channel. Make sure to get to our YouTube channel and subscribe and uh, set the reminder so that you know when we're live. We obviously have several shows that um, you can get all of your Bills content. Um, every single day we have a show basically airing. So get to our YouTube channel there and, of course, CoverOne.net. I'm Eric Turner. That's Nate Geary. Thank you for tuning in to this week's Cover One Film Room. We'll see you next week.